Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. My name is Jasper Worthaus. I am the editor of Ancient Warfare Magazine. And with me today are Mark McCaffrey, Lindsay Powell, Murray Dom, and Mark DeSantis. And um, it's uh, an in-betweener, as we say. Um, so that we means we pick a random topic. And uh, we decided this time we'd talk about our favorite ancient military sources. And why? So um, I guess what we'll just do is I'll just point at someone, even though you can't see it, but but and it won't even make sense for them because I'm pointing at a screen. It could be any of them. <laughs> uh, and uh, and we'll see what what comes up. Mark, uh, Mark DeSantis, I think you said you prepped several. So how about you do the one that we know about or the, the surprise that you you pick? Yeah, I, I, I chose... Arian, uh, because his uh, history of Alexander's campaign, I think, is it's one of the first pieces of ancient military history that I read. And it's one of the first that I ever studied in depth and researched with it. And I think that in terms of its in, in terms of its narrative flow, its overall quality, uh, I think it's very, very high. It's extremely good. And I think that while every work emanating from the ancient world has its flaws, I think this one got across at least, I think, a, a, I think a believable picture of Alexander. Uh, once again, not to say that we take everything at face value simply because Arian presented to us. But I think Arian was a capable historian who was able to himself take the sources that he had and turn it into a, a coherent uh, narrative history of his own. Uh, further, as a military historian, I think that he is of a, a, a great deal of value. And I think that comes from the fact that Arian himself uh, was a soldier in the sense that he commanded from what we understand as governor of Cappadocia, military Roman military forces that were used to expel uh, invading Alans uh, from uh, the uh, within the frontiers of the Roman Empire sometime in the early second century. And I think that having a, a you know real world military experience probably helped him write his history of Alexander. Uh, so I, I would say for me, it's Arian. Uh, I also would like to put forward, he's not a military historian, but and, and I, I think that will still be a surprising choice, but uh, St. Augustine, writing at the end of the period of the Western Roman Empire, so roughly the early uh, 5th century AD, makes several references, multiple references to uh, ancient Roman uh, uh, events, you know, military events, and he does it primarily with the purpose of showing how the the uh, military uh, disasters or, or, or setbacks that the Roman Empire of the fifth century A.D. was experiencing were in no way worse than what had happened, what had befallen the pagan republic uh, of, say, the second or first centuries B.C. And leaving aside, you know, th that aspect of, of his uh, uh, of his history, uh, the I think it's interesting to see how Saint Augustine was able to reach back five, six centuries in time and bring forward, for instance, uh, for example, uh, the Goths had sacked Rome recently in, in 410 A.D., and he was uh, easy. To, uh, he was really able to go back and point out various things that had happened in Roman history, which it's for him to say that the Goths of Alaric were not nearly as bad as, say, earlier uh, disasters. Uh, calamities that had befallen the Romans were much worse. Also, uh, so I, I think the, the, the important point to bring out here is that Augustine had access to and, and, and knowledge of all of these events, which uh, you know, for, for him, uh, for, for us, they would probably be at the distance of, say, the Battle of Pavia or Marignano in the early 16th century, or even Agincourt. So uh, I think it shows that an educated person in of the Roman Empire had this at his fingertips. And so uh, apart from talking about uh, 
uh, the what had happened in the uh, Roman Republic, the civil wars, for instance. He also made mention of how the how uh, Carthage, the fall of Carthage, was a bad thing for uh, Roman morals. That is, they had an enemy that kept them, I think, tough. And once Carthage was gone, they started to decline. He makes mention of uh, Marcus Atilius Regulus, who had been uh, apparently taken prisoner by the uh, Carthaginians. Now, whether or not it, the story was actually true that once he had gone back, he then said, you know, I'll, I'll go back to Carthage as I I swore that I would. But it's 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 a piece of history that was at least he was aware of. So uh, I think that St. Augustine is worth a look, the early books especially, just to see what uh, someone, uh, a Roman intellectual of the late uh, empire, uh, might have actually thought of uh, ancient military historical events. Do you have a specific, um, when you say Arian, do you, do you have a, uh, a translation in mind? <laughs> uh, well, the, my translation was the, the the first one I ever came across was the Penguin translation. So uh, it was it's the Aubrey de Salincourt translation. Uh, I, I happen to enjoy it. Uh, I'm not going to say that other translations aren't just as good, but the... Uh, his translation to Selencore was the one that I've had for decades now. So going on over 30 years. And his access to sources, of course, is one of the other reasons why he's so great because, you know, he's reading Ptolemy and we can't read Ptolemy. and He's reading X, Y, Z and we can't read X, Y, Z. We can only read Arian. Most of the histories of Alexander, uh, the, 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 the original history, actually, I, I would say any, anything written, you know, e even near his uh, lifetime are gone. So, uh, and we were forced to rely upon someone like Arian, who at least had access to them. And I uh, think that's why he's very valuable. Well, even Plutarch, really, you know, you look at Plutarch and um, he's not writing history. He tells us he's not writing history. And yet still, most people use him as, as a historian with a, a, sing, a single sentence at the start going, well, he was writing biography and that's it. And you're like, surely that has something to do with why he's, you know, not telling us what any other source tells us because perhaps he you know didn't have the same set of rules um you know but uh but again he was he had material that we can't possibly read which is which is you know makes him all the more valuable you bring up a wonderful question why would it be that uh, uh, the history uh, as written by ptolemy disappeared uh, he's, he's not the only monarch that ever had a history that disappeared uh, i think claudius uh, the emperor claudius Penned at least two, one on Carthage and one on on the Etruscans, both uh, all gone. I don't, I don't know, Mark. I think uh, what is it? estimates are that about two percent or something like that of ancient... and you're being generous there. Of the typically here, one percent, isn't it? That survives from ancient. So, so the default is it disappeared. You don't have to find anything suspicious about it. It's just like yeah, gone. Well, I like I like the fact that the, the greatest surviving, like in terms of quantity, it's Galen. And then you then you read like it's 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 some enormous proportion of what survives from the ancient world, like thirty seven percent is Galen's writings. You like, and, and is that because it was of practical value? And uh, well, he was the he's the greatest doctor of his age, um, and uh, you know he's the he did write physician. a lot. Yeah, he did. He wrote a lot. He's a kind of a Cicero of the Antonine era. Um, he was the personal physician of uh, Marcus Aurelius, so uh, quite. Quite amazing. If you're a medieval monk, that's useful, right? You want to be able to have actionable, useful material. Yeah. So you know, and you know, he describes the plague, for instance, um, in in Rome in the one sixties. So it's it's quite remarkable what he what he does. But then you know, there's so much we would just swap it out for in a in a heartbeat. The, if we could. Th there's a great deal of Saint Augustine that has survived too. So. Uh, yeah, city, yeah, city of God is city of God is quite large. Lindsay, <laughs> what's your favorite? I, I, I've chosen uh, Cassius Dio, um, and I and I think the reason is because it, it's the longest consistent sort of chronicle of, of of Roman history, and apart from that, it's a sort of encyclopedia of interesting facts interweaved uh, into sort of uh, long narrative sections of history. Um, it, it's how, for example, we know. Uh, the deployment of the Roman legions, for example, under Augustus. And even though it's influenced by his own day, he's writing at the time of the Severan emperors, it's very useful to have that sort of thing. We only have another one, which is Tacitus's account, which is uh, writing for a few years later. 
Um, and he tells us about, for example, how the, uh, the, 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 the Roman watch, the night watch, came into being. Um, and, and all these sorts of details are superimposed into a text which is a chronicle. So it begins with the consuls are elected for the year, so you know exactly which year you're talking about, and there are a whole series of events, um, and characters come and go, and some of them have played, like, for example, Julius Caesar, obviously towering figures in the narrative, or uh, Augustus uh, and various other people. And basically he's writing from the foundation of the city, 753 BC, to his own day in, in, in the early 200s, AD. So it's a, it's a vast span. Now, of course, a lot of the volumes don't survive. I think he wrote 142 of them, and I think it's only about 35 or something like that actually survive. We only know about the contents of some of them because of these, uh, effectively, their library tags called the perioke, um, which have sort of short summaries of what was what was in there. So we know that the uh, you know the, the 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 last of these books, I think, um, I'm confusing. I'm sorry, I'm confusing with with Livy. So I've been reading Livy today. So scrap John, all that bit. John um, John, John Zephyrinus, the summaries of yes, Zephyrinus. Yes, that's that's yes. Yeah, so so we we have him that sort of uh, praises and, and and summarizes some of the things, which is confusing because we're not quite sure how much he praises and what is actually authentically the voice of uh, Cassius Dio. So anyway, so I like him very much because from 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 me writing biographies of Augustus and his commanders, it's wonderful to have a pretty consistent historical structure in which to track these people's lives and events, um, interposed with these wonderful little details, like I said about you know, the deployment of the Roman army, or the building of like the Pantheon, or, or whatever the, the structure might well be. Um, and it's interposed with his uh, invented speeches for, for different people in the traditional style of, of Roman history. But um, it's all written in Greek, of course, not Latin. Um, so if you're looking for the Loeb classics, you'll find it in the green covers, not the red ones. Uh, there are several volumes, in fact, because there, there are so many that uh, are covered in that. But uh, it's fairly easy reading. It, it, it's not sort of literature and it, it's, it's not terribly dense. But if you like facts and you like sort of trying picking together uh, campaigns. And when I wrote my Augustus at War, what was amazing to me was how thorough he was in presenting that there was this war in this theatre and this war in that theatre. And occasionally he could get very bored of it and say, lots of wars happened this period, nothing of interest to report. And then the following year, and you, I, I mean, you did what? You did what? Yeah, sort of editorial red pen right through the whole of a year or two or three, added to which you get these lacunae um, in, in the actual the, the missing documents. So that's very frustrating because you don't know, you know, whole tracts of history and why they worked the way they did. But so Cassius Dyer, I highly recommend him. And and my sort of um, my uh, surprise recommendation would be Villas Patuculus, uh, so because he was actually a serving commander, soldier, a certainly person of, of military experience in a way that Cassius Dio probably was not. Uh, Cassius Dio was an administrator, a senator for his for his career. But uh, it's very clear that um, what, what he was doing, uh, particularly in writing his Roman history, was again, he was trying to write a long period of history, but it's only in two books. So compare that with, you know, hundreds of books for, or 80 books, like 80 books for Cassius Dio and, 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 uh, and just two for and he's often rubbished by modern scholars because he tends to, because of the uh, the time he served under Tiberius, who eventually became emperor, he sort of was a little bit awestruck. So you you get the sense that maybe he's writing a, a sort of a, 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 a version of history which really puts Tiberius in this wonderful glow of achievement, and he is the chosen one in some respects. I think that's overstated. Uh, I think if you actually read what he actually writes, it's pretty factual. It's pretty straightforward. And yes, there are some uh, sort of high praises of, of Tiberius. But it's also how we get to learn how, for example, in the battlefield, Tiberius had his litter ready for wounded troops so that his litter and his physician was available to help wounded soldiers uh, because he saw it. Uh, he would, And that was the sort of detail that would probably get lost in a Cassius Dio. Um, or, for example, he will. there's a, there's a beautiful moment where in, in 84 where uh, Velis Paterkos is actually part of the entourage going with Tiberius to the German frontier, where, where Paterkos will, will take over his assignment as uh, prefectus. And on the way, uh, as they're going through the camps, he records this passage where the soldiers say, is that you, Tiberius? I served with you on the, on, in, in uh, Pannonia, or I served with you in, in this place or that place. And again, these are little kind of cameo moments which really personalize history, I think, because he was the witness of them. 
And it's not often you, you actually see that in, in a written history because those people are re- relying on written documents. He's relying on his experience as well as written documents. So I think I think it's very compelling for that reason. Of course, he doesn't just discuss his the, the history that he actually experienced himself. I mean, he goes way back. When does he start? I think the Trojan War, actually. Yeah, it goes back to the Trojan War. He goes through some of the earlier stuff very quickly and then... But it's more or less complete, isn't it? Yes, as far as I understand, it mostly is. Um, and, and most of it really is down from the f- period of Julius Caesar's assassination to Augustus. And then finally, uh, it's the early years of uh, Tiberius's reign. And what would be very interesting, because he's he's living at the time of Sejanus, Sejanus. Um, so he sees those two working as a, as, as a co-regents is not the right word, but working in, as colleagues. Um, and, and it's not yet apparent the wickedness that Sejanus is inflicting on the Republic. So we don't, it would be very interesting had he lived a few more years and written about the, to the end of Tiberius, whether his uh, glowing sort of praise, uh, really sort of portraying Tiberius as this very accomplished successor to Augustus, carrying on the task, uh, the best qualified man in the world to do it sort of thing, uh, all the while being duped by Sejanus. You know, I mean, th- this this is not really something that's covered in there, but it but it's straightforward reading. It, it's not terribly hard. Uh, a lot of people, I think, um, that use it to actually learn Latin because the Latin isn't isn't that hard or literary. Uh, for that reason, a lot of people kind of downplay him because I say it's not terribly sophisticated. But but I look at it; he's a soldier, he's trained as a military man, and 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 you can imagine someone used to writing reports and after action reports wouldn't be a literate sort of person writing flowery language, and he doesn't. You know, one of the the when you mentioned the the glossing over of Cassius Dio of uh, various wars that were taking place at certain points of time. Uh, I mean, one of the fr- most frustrating parts of Polybius is when in uh, he's discussing the latter years of the first Punic War, where uh, uh, Hamilcar Barca is fighting the Romans. And he talks about all of the stratagems that they, he, you know, makes passing reference to them, but he doesn't bother to actually tell you any of the real details of what was going. He just says that they were all, you know, all sorts of uh, fighting ambushes and things like that. I, I would have loved to know what was going on in Sicily uh, with, with Hamilcar, Hamilcar Barca's troops fighting the Romans and what he did, because uh, Hamilcar was clearly a, a brilliant general in his own right, uh, uh, with a wonderful reputation, and he had the loyalty of his soldiers under the most trying of circumstances. Uh, w- what did he do that he managed to keep the Romans at bay for all of those years? And he was never defeated in the field. He he was told to evacuate Sicily. He was never defeated by the Romans. This is this is the kind of thing that the Romans don't want you to know. The thing about the interesting about Paterculus because he's one of the sources for the disaster of AD nine in Teutoburg. Um, and, and because he'd served within that geography, I mean, it's very interesting to read his kind of account as well. And he singles out individuals for, for praise, which, uh, which again, it, we, we thrive on the details, the like minutiae of, of combat and, 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 and warfare and so on. And, and that's the sort of source I relish studying because you get these things in there where someone like a Cassius Dio, if it's not in the chronicle or the official documentation, he's uh, probably not going to know about it. Um, and I'm sure he leaned heavily into Livy and uh, Tacitus as well as his sources. Um, but but no, uh, Paterculus is, I think, an underrated uh, historian. It would have been very nice if um, Pliny's store histories of the Germanic Wars had survived, because again, served in that served in that war at the same slightly later, probably. Uh, I think slightly later. Yeah. Yes. And 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 in fact, uh, he is a source that Tac- Tacitus uh, actually a quote. Uh, I think quotes him. Uh, as a source for some of his statistics or facts. Um, and in fact, his uh, nephew, Pliny the Younger, of course, actually lists his book, the, 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 All the Wars in Germany or something, uh, which which tells us again that we don't know that very much or about many of them. So, so when people try and write sort of authoritative histories, we've got to remember that in the sense where the, uh, the lucky but unfortunate victims of editorial decisions by these ancient historians. I mean, they've decided to include or not include, and we don't know what they miss half the time. Mark, what is your favourite source? My favourite? Um, I've got two that I was going to mention. Uh, one, which is, uh, I think there'll be some people who argue he's not necessarily a military source, but I would go with Cicero for, you know, the, the go-to source of the first century BC He is a brilliant source, and even though he's not necessarily focusing on warfare, 
in a, a century that's focused on you know civil war after civil war, the personalities that come into play in those civil wars are really brought to life by Cicero's writings. Now, of course, Cicero writes in terms of we've got his legal speeches, we've got his philosophical treaties, uh, treatises. Um, you've, but I would say the most important literature to come out of Cicero, or the most interesting, is actually in terms of the letters, and that's letters to, in particular, Atticus, who's his lifelong friend, who uh, millionaire playboy who resides most of the time in Greece and needs to be brought up to speed a lot of the time. Um, but at the same time, family and friends in in general, we've got such a, a wide scope there of the the important players in Rome during Cicero's life now. Now, of course, the, the letters, they don't necessarily go throughout his entire career. They're collected at the end of his career, we're told possibly by Tyro, his uh, his secretary slave most of his career. Um, they only, uh, or the collection that as they exist, only really start in 62 BC onwards. So therefore it sort of misses his his climb to in politics up to the consulship in 63. But at the same time, it's sort of the contents of those letters then proceed to sort of cover the uh how can I say that, the fallout from his consular year and one of my favourite topics, the Catalan conspiracy and that sort of thing. Um, but it sort of brings to life, on the one hand, those characters who you sort of get mentioned in the histories who you don't really get filled out, you know, because they're under the shadow of Caesar or Pompey. But at the same time, you get little snapshots of dealings with those greats and, again, it's like Lindsay was saying, it's those little, you know, snapshots of a little bit of personal experience and personal interaction with these people that Cicero, and, and at the same time, I think the fun thing is that you sort of read Cicero and you're just at the same time trying to work out he's, he's very human and you got it and you can sort of see the you know the political workings of his of his words in terms of how is he trying to deal with each of these um, individuals? Who is he trying to play to their um, their personalities and their foibles? Is Cicero you know does he go you know pleading to Pompey at times or is he trying to play Pompey at times? It's it's something that you can come back to time and time again it, with each new reading. You sort of get that little bit more, you know, a, a, another sort of question in your mind as you go through. So I think it's, you know, something that you can come back to time and time again. At the same time, you get those little snapshots of personalised life of, uh, and the details of Roman life, like, for example, you know, his addressing of uh, little Tullia, his daughter, in the letters, you've got the references to his wife Terentia and her support, um, financial and otherwise, during his exile in fifty-eight. It's it, it's those little details that sort of come through and help us to sort of understand the the political workings of Rome and what's behind some of the the family dynamics and the personal dynamics that are behind politics in that first century. So I'd say Cicero and his letters would be the, a real must in terms of understanding the military workings of Rome in that century. Uh, the second one, going against what Mark said, uh, I would be going with Quintus Curtius for a, a history of Rome. Uh, uh, sorry, history of Augustus. Uh, what am I saying? Yeah, Alexander. Oh. Um, too many topics. Um, in terms of Alexander, it is. Um, in terms of Alexander, yes, we've sort of got these sources that are all produced after the fact. There's, you know, second hand in terms of they are utilising sources that have disappeared. Quintus Curtius is the, the Roman source written in Latin. Uh, and he is, of course, also, he's influenced by his own literary world. And he is, after that, you know, he's basing himself on that model of Livy and trying to deliver a, uh, a history of Alexander. Uh, but at the same time, it flows that much more. And, okay, it's, sometimes some of it can be called into question um, uh, 
in certain aspects and you go to the other sources and there's, there's that disagreement. But at the same time, it, it gives a, a good running narrative of Alexander's campaigns, albeit not complete because, of course, you're missing the first two books and also you know, you've got a bunch of different lacunae throughout uh, as you go through. But still, I think if you want a a good narrative of Alexander from the primary sources, that would be my preference. I think it's interesting with Curtius. I was, I was criticised for relying too much on Curtius Rufus, but the fact of the matter is that he provides detail which looks entirely credible and the detail that he provides is coincidentally in the spots where Arian and Plutarch don't provide it. So, you know, when you take it in, in, in It's got that bit more logic to it, really. And when you take it in combination with them, you can be more balanced. Yeah. I mean, as you say, it has been unpopular uh, in various circles over the years. It does bring in, you know, some of the more fanciful stories about Alexander at times, uh, things like the Gordian Knot, for example. Um, but at the same time, it does, uh, I think, deliver a consistent character of Alexander throughout. I agree with you on Cicero. I, I, I think it's marvellous that we actually have a witness and a participant in events to the point where you can actually say to the day and sometimes the hour of the day. Uh, and the one thing I think we're all envious of modern historians is with, with access to letters and film footage and, and newspapers and all the rest of it is they can very precisely chronicle things and they can put them on a chronology and the thing we struggle with all the time is is actually trying to actually precisely align things in ancient history. You know, I mean, you know, again, to take that the guy I picked, I mean, Cassius Dio will make some assessments based on what he knows. Um, and I was looking at recently, I was just doing something about Hannibal today. Um, and in fact, it was uh, Cornelius Fronto actually admits that even when he was writing, there were three different estimates as the year in which Hannibal died. How could he have three different years, right? So, but that's the problem that we have as ancient historians. So when you look at Cicero, when you have that precision and the authenticity of a voice, um, you can forgive him that he saved the Republic and did all the other things. <laughs> um, and he had a horrible end, of course. So, so you know, it, it already ended miserably. But but we have his letters. We have his writings. It's great. His value also can be judged by the, what we're missing as well, because it's, I always think it's interesting in terms of the inclusions in the, in the collection of letters that one notable exception, which we know he he corresponded with greatly, is, of course, the young Augustus Octavian. And, of course, those letters are d deliberately not there. I find it interesting when you look when you look at modern historians and they've got video footage and they still don't know what's going on. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, the one of the things that surprises a lot of young people when you're talking about being a historian is the ease with which an ancient historian says we don't know. We haven't. We just don't know. And they're like, "But you're a historian. How can you not know?" It's like because the sources don't tell us. And as a historian, we need to stop speculating at a certain point and go, you know, this is where we we we're in the realm of historical fiction, not not speculative history. And they're always gobsmacked because you know. And I tell them the two two examples I use are uh, you know Kennedy's assassination. It was filmed, and we still don't know what happened. Um, or, you know, that, that kind of idea that if you have a divorce and you ask one party what happened and you have the other party, you're going to get two very, very different accounts of what went on on the same set of events. And, you know, it's not it's not a lawsuit in the sense that, you know, as a historian, you're not a judge in terms of which is the truth. But in a way, you are saying this is what happened. Uh, and you're And you're not doing the here's one side, here's the other. You're doing the combined this is what happened. And we do the whole, whereas this source is this, and this source has an alternative view and does this instead. And you know, and, and the and the wonderful thing is the grandfather, the, the father of history, Herodotus, knew that, which is why he went out and actually got witness testimony, actually got people, and he he recognized that people didn't see the same thing the same way. Um, which which is marvelous. So in a sense, written history starts with the man who recognized that fundamental problem. Uh one of our patrons actually wrote in just because we put out the question and it, and it, this actually does make for a segue to you, Murray, because he says that his favorite is Aeneas Tacticus, because he uh, he thinks it's interesting because he wrote essentially the first how-to book in history. Defending a Greek city is interesting in how you organize both the citizens and the mercenaries, and it falls into that interesting pre-Hellenistic Greek period. 
uh, well, you know, pre and post Hellenistic new dating system. But um, Murray wrote about this in Asia Warfare a long time ago. A long, long time ago. Well, that was my that was my first master's degree back in 1992. Uh, was looking at the what did I call it? It wasn't the that genre. long ago that you wrote for ancient history, though. Uh, no, no, no. The 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 genre of ancient didactic military literature, um, which which is a very niche genre even to this day, despite my best efforts to make it uh, far more uh, <laughs> better known. Um, and my favorite, my my two favorite sources are from within that genre. Um, not surprising. Well, surprising. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, Aeneas Tacticus is fascinating because we have how to survive a siege, which is written, we think, in the four fifty, sorry, the three fifties BC, uh, because he doesn't mention Philip of Macedon, so he must be writing before he comes to the fore, and he writes seven other books that we know of because he mentions them in his own one surviving book i wrote this one i wrote this one i'm going to write this one in the future um which is which is uh, fascinating as well uh in that period in the uh you know the the 360s bc where there seems to be a, a whole bunch of authors writing this is how you should do things mostly uh aeneas tacticus is surviving but of course xenophon as well and xenophon's fascinating i have a very difficult relationship with xenophon one of the fascinating things about xenophon of course is that we have everything xenophon wrote complete and almost unique in the ancient world that we have an author where we know all of their writings and we have all of Xenophon and weirdly for Xenophon, you know, who's the only uh, author from 411 BC down to 360 BC. He's a continuous historical narrative in the Hellenica. Um, I unfortunately think that most of the time he's giving us Xenophon's version of events, which is not particularly what was going on, but that's okay. Um, but, but he's not who I want to talk about. And, and he and Aeneas Tacticus, of course, are writing, uh, these sort of how-to books, and that's where the genre begins uh, and then takes off under Alexander and after. Um, but um, I was going to follow what Mark DeSantis said about, you know, the the Penguin translation of Arian. My first exposure to ancient history was the Penguin translation of Herodotus, and that really made me fall in love with Herodotus. And if there was any ancient author I would pick up to read for fun, it would be Herodotus. At the same time as a military historian, you know, considering he wrote the histories and it's about the Persian Wars, there's so much in the histories that's not about the Persian Wars. And, you know, you get to the end of book six and you're like, oh, here comes the Battle of Marathon. It's the whole, it's the, it's the linchpin. And, you know, eight chapters that you're like, is that it? W what? There's so many questions about what we don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, and then you get to the, to the later books and you've got the same kind of, we, we don't really know what happened after reading that. And yet it was fascinating and fun the whole time, um, which is, you know, and then you read all the alternatives and you're like, I still don't know what happened. Gosh. Anyway, so my favorite two authors are from this genre, um, and they are the only two surviving collections of stratagems from the ancient world. One written by Sextus Julius Frontinus in probably about 87 AD, and the other by Polyinus of Macedon, written in between 161 and 162 AD. So uh, it's this entire genre of ancient literature, which we think begins in the Hellenistic period after Alexander the Great. Uh, none of those examples survive. We've got several works named by um, the amazing um, bibliophile from the Byzantine area, Photius, who has this huge list of books that he recommends to his brother, uh, which he gives us this this very brief pricey of, uh, which is a fascinating source in itself, generally because when we do have the book surviving, his pricey is very accurate. So for the books that we don't have surviving, which is most of them, we kind of go, well, Photius tells us that he said this, that that's useful. So we have all these lists about, and frustrating, we have all these lists of other um, stratagem collections, none of which survive. So we have these two collections of stratagems. Frontinus is, again, uh, fascinating because he's one of the most successful generals of the first century AD, and yet no one's ever heard of his name. He begins his career under Claudius and then serves every emperor without break, which is fascinating in itself because he serves Vespasian, he serves Dom Domitian, he serves Nerva, and he serves Trajan without anyone going, hang on a minute, you were loyal to the last regime, we're not employing you anymore, which is what most people in the first century AD have at some point. And, you know, because he served, well, before that he served Nero. So, you know, Claudius, Nero, the four emperors, then he's, you know, just amazing. Um, and he commands in various different places, which is fascinating in itself. And then he writes down, a 
science of military knowledge, um, a de re militari, which is lost, although we think Vegetius, when he's writing in the 4th century AD, uses frontlines. Uh, and then at the beginning of the stratagems, he says, since I've written that, and we're like, no, oh, it's lost, um, I'm going to write down a whole bunch of anecdotes to illustrate the, the, the examples of science, the military science that I've written. And of course, one of the fascinating things about stratagems, you don't get any of the theory. You just get the example. So they don't say, you know, this illustrates chapter seven of what I was talking about. They just go, here's something that a general did. Here's something that a general did. So Frontinus has 500 and 585, 485, about, around about the 500 stratagems, which are mostly Roman. Uh, there are there are some Greek ones. The frustrating thing for me is that they these collections are generally plundered for the historical information that they provide that other sources don't. So there are several battles, Chironia probably being the most interesting one, where the stratagem collections are the ones that give us the best picture because the historical sources don't survive for that battle. And at the same time, there are stratagems that contradict our known sources or that give you the opposite action in a particular situation. You're surrounded by the enemy. Oh, well, we we, we surrender. Or no, no, we fight our way out. You're like, okay, well, which one is the better one? And they don't give any judgment on that. They just go, in this situation, this is what this general did. Um, so that that's fascinating for me because there's some kind of practical body to it. And Frontinus is you know, vastly experienced as a military historian. I'm getting all choked up because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting emotional about my historians, but I'm, 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 you know, literally joking. So Polyinus is the opposite of Frontinus. He is a uh, a lawyer. He's an advocate for Marcus Aurelius. And the fascinating thing at the beginning of Marcus Aurelius's reign, of course, is we've had the reigns of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius, um, who haven't led armies in person. And the last emperor to lead an army in person is Trajan in, in his Parthian campaign around 117 AD. And at the beginning of Marcus Aurelius's reign, um, he immediately adopts his brother Lucius Verus as a co-emperor. There's wars everywhere. And, you know, there's a war in Britain, there's a war in Parthia, there's a war in Spain, there's a war on the German frontier, there's a war on the Danube frontier, uh, there's a war in Africa. It's like everyone took their opportunity to rebel against Roman rule at that point. So they have to serve uh, all of these wars. And... Lucius Verus decides he's going to lead the Parthian War in person. And this is like the gold standard literary event of, of that period. Every writer writes something for the emperors to read about what's going to happen. And of course, they're all wanting to get their own job out of it. And Polyinus is one of those who survives. Uh, and so he tells us that he's writing a set of stratagems, 900 stratagems going back to mythology and... He does them ethnographically, which is fascinating in itself. Like he has the the fourth book is the, the, the book of Macedonian stratagems. So he he only looks at the Macedonians. Uh, book seven is the barbarian stratagem. So he only looks at barbarians, which is interesting division by itself. And he has more stratagems than Frontinus, but he's also one of these armchair historians who's, you know, he never saw a battlefield um, and he's compiling from various different sources uh, you get people abusing him for being a cut and paste author, but at the same time, he's got access to sources we don't have. There's a, a lots of anecdotes which don't survive otherwise in other um, histories, and he gives us massive amounts of insight into not only the the genre that he's writing in, but also the literary environment in which he was writing. Because otherwise, we have Lucian's How to Write History, which basically starts with an abuse of all of these other historians who are writing for Lucius Verus and their crimes against history that they write, uh, you know, and how, how appallingly bad they are. Um, and, you know, we have all these sort of names of works which were being ad addressed to Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius, but they don't survive. And we have this one example, uh, which I don't put in the same category because, you know, he's already in front of the emperors at Rome. Uh, he writes before the campaign departs for the East whereas most of these other ones are chasing the uh, Lucius Verus's court around the East, trying to get attention. Um, so that, you know, in addition to the, the military history value that you've got in the source material, they, 
both offer incredibly interesting insights into imperial careers and how you can you know advance yourself and what you what you are capable of doing so. cool mm. what about yours Jasper? i'll just add one because we're getting on um uh, it's a uh, i think he's been called that boring old fart on roman army talk once um <laughs> Vegetius, of course, um, the epitome of military science. I mean, he, he is both fascinating and frustrating in, in equal measure, I think. He's just full of stuff, facts about what the army should be like, was like, or is, um, uh, how sieges should be conducted. And, uh, and for my particular interest, the uh, first time I met him was reading about what he says about naval warfare, um, which consists about half of it is about what you should do to make sure that there's no storm and predict the wind and the weather, which is very sensible when you're going out to sea in fragile ships, but it doesn't teach you very much about naval warfare. But, and I, and I remember many, many discussions on Roman Army Talk and lots of ink has been poured over this. Yeah all these details that are in Vegetius and nowhere else. It's like, is this adaptable? Is this pertinent to this topic? Does it make any sense at all? Where did he get it from? Is it a fifth century or fourth century thing? Is it maybe second century BC that he got it from? It is like a grab bag of all kinds of details that pop up everywhere. I mean, um, if you see, well, we were talking about ospreys before uh, before we started the recording. You know, in any osprey, you see a Roman naval soldier. He'll be wearing blue. That's from Vegetius. It, you know, never mind that Vegetius talks about a very particular use by the British fleet in reconnaissance missions that might or may not be wearing blue. I mean, there's articles about that too. That it's not actually blue. It may be the Venetian blue of the uh, the sports team. Never mind. That's where it comes from, and all these details. Of what what's it from? What is he saying? It's like it is so interesting to read, and it's like every single sentence you can try and find. Where is it fit from? And and can I use it? Is it useful for what I'm researching or not? And it actually gets me to um, something that and I asked uh, Mark in the beginning. What translation do you use? And you know, because that's really, it's a very relevant question when you're going to discuss any source. Are you going to read it in the original Latin or Greek? Um, you know, is that is that something that you can do? Are you able to do that? Um, are you going to get all the nuances? And then you, can you get a really good translation and preferably an edited translation that gives you References like, I mean, I've got this Vegetius here and it has lots of footnotes to say, look, this might come from here. This is, you know, paralleled by this source, by that source. And um, Arian, I think, has appeared in the Landmark Historian. Um, Carlos watching live says, what about Julius Caesar, um, the Gallic Wars? Yes, of course, it's compelling for everyone uh, to read. I think I think you're completely right. And again, Landmark Historian's. Uh, absolutely the, the the text to read it with probably because it puts the same with Cicero's letters. I was thinking, you know, you can read Cicero's letters, but it's very helpful if you've got a, a lot of context at your fingertips. Who are these people? Uh, what role are they playing at the time he's writing to them um, or about them? It, it It is lovely to read text like Herodotus just by himself. He is indeed, he's just fun. But if you can read him with a good good source text and with lots of maps so you can know where are we now, what are we talking about, what is reflected in other texts, that, that just makes it makes it a lot of extra a lot of extra fun to, to be be your own historian a bit. To, to your point, Jasper, uh, you, somebody was asking you about uh, Caesar's Gallic War. Uh, Jay Arnold in Illinois, USA. I, I've been tweeting, by the way, as we've been talking. He writes, uh, Caius Julius sees of his unabashed self-promotion and, frankly, his relatively simple writing style that was a godsend to a second semester classics major. <laughs> so, so, so the Latin language is important in this. 
Omni, Omnia Gallia Tre Partes. Yes, yes. Um, yes. And then, and then, as Phyllis Protectorus, not very complicated. Tacitus apparently is. Anabasis uh, 1, isn't it, for Greek? Isn't that right, Mark? Anabasis 1 is yeah, the best uh, notorious. example. Mm. But uh, I think one of the things about Vegetius, of course, is that his name, there's a debate. Who he was writing for, there's a debate. Yeah. When he was writing, there's a there's debate. There's a debate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, can we get past the first word of the no, no, we've got to settle these. And then and the fascinating thing about those debates, of course, is that there is no settling them because they're open. Everything is just it's circular questions. because it all comes from him. I think you can do that with any of the sources that we've talked about, though, in terms of, you know, as I said, with someone as well versed as Cicero and you know, someone you think you know know that source and you've got so much information about him, you can still, you know, tease out that little, you know, that little extract of, you know. How serious was he about this? You know, what what was his real opinion? You know, is he when he's talking about the um, first triumvirate as three headed dog, uh, or if he's talking about his suicidal thoughts when he's in Dracium? Um, you know, it's it, still you, you've got a source there that's you're sort of thinking, is he playing to the crowd? Is he playing to his intended audience? Was he thinking that this would go out later on? Because, of course, he can, you know, he famously, every one of his uh, court cases, uh, which he he thought, to, you know, he wanted to publish and get out there to a wider audience, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, he'd go back and edit first before it, uh, it appeared in print. You know, did he, have, did he have a mind to posterity? Didn't he come up with the statement, something along the lines, I paraphrase, I'm not worried about what people think about me today. It's 500 years from now I'm worried about. Yeah, and that whole thing about, you know, that, and it's uh, very early on in his career. It keeps coming back when he goes to Sicily as um, as governor and spend, spends his time down there doing all these brilliant things, you know, lowering the, the grain, uh, grain prices for the uh, common Roman and whatnot, uh, sending back all of these correspondence. And again, that's prior to the 62 threshold. So therefore, we don't have that correspondence. But he talks about all this correspondence that went back. And yet when he got back, coming back from Sicily, he arrives in uh, not Naples, but um, uh, Pozzuoli, um, getting off the ship and someone walks up to him and says, so what's the news in Rome? And he says, I didn't, I'm not coming from Rome. I'm coming from Sicily. Don't you know? And this friend of his says, no, I, I thought you were coming from Rome. Sorry, my mistake. And of course, Cicero realizes, <laughs> oh, they weren't all talking about me after all. Therefore, I cannot leave Rome from now on. I must be there. Everybody can see me. It's, it's like the Facebook. So, it's like the yeah, Facebook. Just, yeah. Facebook of the ancient world. Did, have you not seen my updates? Have you not been following my story? Oh, come on. Did you not see my TikTok? It's like, no, I, I, I've been off social media. And it's like, you know, Cicero's world crumbles because no one's kept, kept up with what he's been up to. I think there's a, there's a PhD in that. Uh, social media. <laughs> oh, is. good. I was looking Cicero's forward. fragile ego. So, so, social media and Cicero. Well, we really, I mean, we really get into the, into the absolute heart of the, of the business of being an ancient historian here, you know, looking at the sources, finding the sources, and mostly running into the frustration of knowing that the sources did exist at one point, but are no longer accessible, or only somebody provides you with a tantalizing glimpse of what once may have been. Or that horrible moment when the source actually burnt, and you've got that reference to it. Well, um, Eumenes' tent going up in flames with the you know the daily accounts of Alexander's campaigns and you're just crying as you sort of read that. But um, that's why we thrive on it, isn't it? Because it's it's just an endless in terms of its uh, possibilities, and someone might yet find a scroll or an inscription, and who knows? Answer all our questions. Well, well one or two of them probably probably raise probably ra raise more than answer, unfortunately. Oh, well, ancient history, it's more holes than it's like Swiss cheese. Helvetian <laughs> cheese, please. Thank you very much again. We'll see you soon again. Bye-bye. <laughs>